so okay All right, peace everybody. Um, all praise, glory, and honor is most certainly due to the most high the God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And peace to you in the name of Jesus. This is your brother Elisha Israel of the household of faith. And I count it to that blessing each and every time that I can come before the priest the word of God, and never do I count it as a light thing to do so. All right, I know I'm coming on a little late. Um, and my apologies to you. Nevertheless, I'm trying to get this thing together. So, because I mentioned on Wednesday, I will be dealing with Islam. Okay, so one thing about it, like anything else, you deal with false and so many things, and it's like, man, oftentimes people. Let me say, there's people who even believe in Islam don't understand Islam, and and one of the one of the main reasons this is is because this book, the Quran, is written in a way, first of all, it's not chronological, I'm not saying it has to be chronological, because the Bible in a lot of instances is not chronological. But one thing this this book does is that it it basically uh, goes against itself. What I mean by that is in one instance, it'll have, um, it'll have things that are said, and then it'll in the same. Sometimes in the same book, the same surah, or in a different surah, it would have a contradiction. And so, to understand the historical context and to understand what's going on in the Quran. You have to actually read these hadiths by these uh by these scholars okay um so that's <laughs> that could be very problematic and so what i want to do right now is i want to go over some of the things so i'm gonna put this in several parts this is part one dinner with mohammed okay because what i'm gonna do is show you who mohammed was and then I'm gonna I'm gonna show you who he who he was as far as morally and what he did, okay, and show how he is a false prophet, okay. Um, so let's go. Hopefully this shows. All right. Let's see. So this is part one. All right. Uh, let's see, everybody. This is part one. Refuting Islam. I'm start. I'm first starting with his immoral behavior. Deal with the pagan origins of Islam that he brought to the people. Then the false prophecies that he put forth. There's so many things. Now, first one, again, you have to go to these hadiths to understand what's going on in the in the in the in the Quran. And one of the things that many Muslims try to refute, but it's irrefutable when you look at these hadiths and what these what has been said concerning Muhammad. All right, now this is Bukhari. This is the most prominent, uh, uh, prominent hadith, if you will. It says, this is narrated by Aisha. This is one of his wives. So now listen to what's written about, about this man. It says, the prophet engaged me when I, this is narrated by this Aisha. This is a girl he married when she was six. And it wasn't just some, all oh, he married her when she was six, and and that was all. In uh, volume five, book 58, number 234, we read, the prophet engaged me when I was a girl of six years. We went to Medina and stayed at the home of Ani al Harith bin Pizaraj. Then I got ill and my hair fell down. Later on, my hair grew again, my mother, Um Rahman, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. She called me and I went to her not knowing what she wanted to do to me. She called me by the hand and made me stand at the door of the house. I was breathless then. And when my breathing became all right, she took some water and rubbed my face and head with it. Then she took me into the house, 
there in the house i saw some unsorry women who said best wishes and allies blessings and a good and a good luck then she entrusted me to them and they prepared me for the marriage unexpectedly allah's apostle now that's talking about muhammad we're going to talk about allah who that is he said but allah's apostle came to me in the forenoon and my mother handed me over to him and at the time i was a girl of nine years of age okay so now he was engaged to her at six but he consummated a marriage with a nine-year-old child just after he married her this is uh so he muslim is aisha reported allah's messenger married me when i was six years old and i was admitted to his house at the age of nine see these are various again hadiths that you will read to give you insight on what the quran is saying so she was admitted to his house at the age of nine. Again, she says it. It wasn't, they again, you have some of those, I said, well, no, he didn't really, that was just, he was engaged to her and he didn't have, no, he consummated that marriage at the age of nine. Again, the, uh, this is Sunan Dawood, it says, the apostle, Allah, Allah married me when I was seven or six, when we came to Medina, some women came According to Bashir's version, um, Rahman came to me when I was singing. They took me, made me, prepared, and decorated me. I was then brought to the apostle of Allah, and he took up cohabitation with me when I was nine. Now, and this gives you insight into that way of thinking. This is something Bukhari wrote that the prophet asked a man. He said, I reply, I'm, I'm starting in the very middle because there's a lot of references here. So I replied, I am newly married. He, talking about the Muhammad, Muhammad said, did you marry a virgin or a matron? I replied, a matron. He said, why didn't you marry a young girl? So that you may play with her and she with you. What's wrong with you? <laughs> How many wives, four or more? Now the, now, the Quran, when you read Surah 4 and 3, one thing you know about Muhammad is that he, things will all, all of a sudden be revealed to him when they were convenient to him. First of all, it's only revealed to him, can't be corroborated like the Holy Scriptures by different individuals, but rather it's only revealed to him and it's contradictions because what happens in his case is things are, thing, when things are convenient for his sordid ways, then it's some kind of revelation. So when you read a sword four and three, here it limits to the number of wives a man can have. And so four and three, it says, if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, married women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one or a captive that your right hands possess that will be more suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. So it's supposed to be talking about justice here. It says, you know, man should have more than four wives. But when all of a sudden it's revealed unto, unto Muhammad, and listen to what Bukhari, uh, in, in his book 5, Hadith 268, he says, the prophet used to visit all his wives around during the day and night, and they were 11 in number. Okay? So now he had 11 wives. And then you read another place where it says, hey, you, you, it don't, don't, uh, don't limit yourself. So he didn't have the same rules as, that, as all other lowly Muslims. Now, here's another case. Now this man, I'm t this man was. This is on top of him being a. This is his, this is him marrying his divorced son's wife. Now this is Tabari again. These hadiths are what you have to read to understand the surahs. So it said one day Muhammad went out looking for Zaid. Now there was a covering of hair cloth over the doorway, but the wind had lifted the covering so that the doorway was uncovered. Zainab was in her chamber undressed and admiration for her into the heart of the prophet after that Allah made her unattractive to say so so now and then even his son and this was an adopted son of his right he's to be a slave and he was adopted he had a wife Muhammad saw her, and now he wants his wife Zani he noticed it it says in Tabari uh, 8 and 1 it says perhaps Perhaps I need has excited your admiration, so I will leave her. Then all of a sudden, because this wasn't the case prior to this, 
But now all of a sudden, there's this revelation. Okay? Surah 33, verse 37 through 38. And when you said to him, to whom Allah has shown favor, and to whom you have shown a favor, keep your wife to yourself and be careful of your duty to Allah. And you concealed in your heart what Allah would bring to light and you fear men. And Allah had a greater right that you should fear him. But when Zayed had accomplished his one of her, we gave her to you as a wife so that there should be no difficulty for the believers in respect of the wives of their adopted sons. So they try to portray this as if, no, what's happening is this was all done so that this can understand it could be about. So you mean to tell me that God brought some people together, had them divorced on purpose so that you could marry your son's adopt, your adopted son's wife so that you could put this forth. No, what happened is you desired this woman. It said, when they have accomplished that one of them and Allah's command shall be performed, there is no harm in the prophet doing that which Allah has ordained for him. He do the things, <laughs> but see, he making it up as he go along. It's so much stuff to break down with Islam. It's not even fucking people talk about Islam. I'm talking about Muslims. They don't understand what's in the Quran. You could possibly understand what's in the Quran because they ain't reading all these things. And when you read it, it's all contradictions. Now, this is the Kaaba and Allah. So now, when people talk about the Kaaba, now that's in Mecca. Okay, and that's what they circle when they take their pilgrimage. Understand what that was. This is Bukhari prior to the rise of Islam. The prophet entered Mecca, and at that time, there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. They had 360 idols. They circled it seven times for the seven uh, things you could see in in the in the in the uh, in the stars. Excuse me, in the sky, in the in space, from with your naked eye. Sun, moon, Venus, etc. They, they, so they venerated these things. Okay. So now, according to him, he's made something basically holy that was unholy. You don't, you can't do that. But that's what, allegedly what he did. So that's what the Kaaba, and it was a stone in there. Let me go. Let me read this here. This is in. This is not on on the screen, but this is from Islamic history of the Middle East. This is a book, Wilson B. Bashai. This is on page 52 uh, or 51. Under pagan idols and beliefs, paganism in North Arabia. Most of the Northern Arabians who were neither Jews nor Christians worshipped a number of gods housed in a shrine called Kaaba inside Mecca, the greatest trade center on the main caravan route from Yemen to Petra. So now they were dealing in this false worship. See, brothers, you can't make something true out of something that's false. So it says cheap among the. Well, let me let me hold off on that. I'll read the rest of that when I get to the name Allah. So now here's the claim in the Quran two and one twenty five. So the claim is that Abraham built it. Remember, it said, remember, we made a house of place of assembly for men and a place of safety and take you the station of Abraham as a place of prayer. And we covenanted in with Abraham and Ishmael that they should sanctify my house for those who can pass it around or use it as a retreat or bow or prostrate themselves therein in prayer. So now he built that. But then he said also uh, that that he also built the temple. Now there's a problem there because you're talking about a problem. You know, the temple was built in the days of Solomon. Okay, so you said he built he built the Kaaba and the temple. That's what Bakari is saying here, or anything at in Jerusalem. That's not that's not accurate. We know you know historically, not just biblically, but historically that the temple it was a temple built in the days of Solomon. You're talking about 950 something. Then that's the first temple. Then you had the second temple. And then you had many years later, Allah's mosque was built. So ain't no way in the world Muhammad built, that's a lie saying he built the Kaaba. Then saying he built something that you, that's a lie. 
many years. That's a lot. It's too many years in between. The black stone that's still there, that's venerated. A principal, say, now this is from the Cyclopedia Britannica. A principal sacred object in Arabian religion was the stone, either a rock outcropping, outcropping or of a large boulder, often a rectangular or irregular black basaltic stone of numerous bedrooms. The best known is the Black Stone of Kaaba at Mecca, which became the central shrine object in Islam, but they were venerating these things already as pagans. Now I want to go back to uh, Islamic history of the Middle East and just deal with the name Allah. It says here, and I'm reading from this book, It says, it says, Mecca was the greatest trade center on the main caravan route from Yemen to Petra. Chief among the Arabian deities was Allah, goddess consort of the sun Uzzah, the personification, personification of Venus. Again, that's what they're seeing in the sky. Menat, the goddess of fate and Hubal, who may have been the god of fertility. Now, Hubel is where they get the sign for the, for the uh, crescent moon. It said, it may be of interest to note here that Allah, whose name is believed to have been borrowing from Hebrew Elohim through Aramaic Eloah, and who later on became the God of Islam, understand this now, what they're saying next, was also included among the Arabian gods in Kaaba. Okay, so now they try to say there's some similarities there, but this God, understand this God, Allah, was one of the one of the guys in that pantheon because there were 360 according to some tra traditions well i'm gonna keep reading uh it says who later became the god of islam was also included among the arabian guys in kaaba according to some traditions shortly before muhammad's life allah was gaining prestige in kaaba and many arabs worshipped him as a chief deity okay so that's how you got that's how you got allah already there Already a false god that they were dealing with. So now let's look at some of the false prophecies of Muhammad. And before we do that, I want to read something in the book of Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy, the uh, 18th chapter. Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. So it says in verse 20 and 22, here you have, you have the test of prophets. It says in verse 20, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Okay, so that's number one. Then it says, and if so, you a prophet shouldn't be speaking of his own as if he's. Speak of a God saying of, is of his own. Then it says, and if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Where it says, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord have not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Right? So you would know if he's speaking things that are not coming to pass, you know, it's not a prophet. Now the Muhammad is called the prophet of Allah, but one thing he doesn't do, he doesn't do any miracles, and he surely doesn't do, he practically doesn't do any prophecies, and the few prophecies that are made are false. I'm going to say that again. Muhammad is not, Muhammad is not like, even when you read some of the so-called minor prophets, and when I say minor prophets, I'm talking about those prophets who the books in the Bible are not very long, but you can line up the prophecies. See, we're not talking about Jeremiah or Isaiah where you got prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. No. We're talking about a, a, a very few prophecies that are made by this so-called prophet who's sleeping with the nine-year-old girl who married his adopted son, who's basically a warlord and an enslaver, and bringing forth all this falsehood. Because we're gonna, I'm gonna break down, and I might, I'm not gonna, I don't want to put too much in at one time, but I'm gonna spread it out. I'm gonna break down 
First, I need to, I need to break down the origins of Islam through the prophet and the paganism of which is founded upon to show you that it's pagan and to show you that this this prophet is no prophet. Okay, so now these are the false prophecies of Muhammad. Okay, so now when you read Surah, I believe it's 30, Surah 30, and you pick it up at, at the at verse 1, Surah 30 and 1, it uh it says the Roman Empire has been defeated in a land close by, but they even after this. Defeat of theirs will soon be victorious within a few years. Okay. So now here, Yusuf Ali, he tells you something that in Arabic, when they're saying a few years, that's literally signifying a period of three to nine years. Why is that problematic? Because according to historical records, the victory did not come until nearly 14 years later. So you are you are dealing with a false prophecy here. Here's another. He made these prophecies of when the end was gonna come. The problem is, is he made them the end is not yet. When you read about Jesus, he's telling you all these things that are gonna take place prior to his coming, right? And it hasn't happened yet. But you can see now how these things could come to pass. He's talking about the, he's talking about when the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Who's gonna read it? Let him understand a temple. He's gonna stand in the temple, right? Paul talked. He prophesied of it. When this man, this man is gonna stand in the temple of God, sit in the temple of God, proclaim himself to be God. That hasn't happened yet, but you can see how those things come to pass. Prophecy after prophecy, from Genesis to Revelation, prophecy after prophecy, even the Psalms full of prophecy. This man, this so-called prophet, this is Bukhari, volume one, book 10, number 575. Again, you have to read these hadiths to know what's going on in the Quran and to know what's going on in Muhammad's life. That's how you find out about Muhammad. You have to read the hadiths and some other works. Leave some serious, but mainly the hadiths. They said a prophet prayed on prophet prayed one of the Isha prayer in his last days, and after finishing it with Taslim, he stood up and said, "Do you realize the importance of this night? Nobody present on the surface of the earth tonight will be living after the completion of one hundred years from this night." Now listen, he's saying basically the end is coming. Some would say, no, he didn't mean that. He was just trying to show them the brevity or the shortness of life. If that was the case, because really, it's some people, let's say somebody's born that year, and then 100 years later, they could still be alive. <laughs> he wasn't saying that. What he was saying was the end was coming. So they try to, they try to, see, one thing they do, they try to clean up these indiscrepancies. Because I'm telling you, when we break this down, because we just scratching the surface, when we break this down, I just want to give you some of this stuff first. When we get into the Quran, straight trash. It said, nobody present on the face surface of the earth tonight would be living after the completion of 100 years. Obviously, that's, that's not right. That's a false prophecy because we still here. Here we see another. It says, I just reported that a person asked Allah's messenger, that's Muhammad, as to when the last hour will come. He had in his presence a young boy of the answer who was called Muhammad. Allah's messenger said, now listen to what he said. Now he's asked, like when you read Matthew 24, the, the uh, disciples came unto him privately say, tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming into the end of the world? So they're asking this man a, a, a similar question. And this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the Messiah walked the earth. Nevertheless, he said he had in his presence a young boy of the answer, Ansar, who was called Muhammad. Allah's messenger, who is Muhammad, this so-called prophet, said, if this young boy lives, he may not grow very old till he would see the last hour coming to you. All right. So now in another Account of that same uh, 
Version of that same account, it said, Anonymous reported Allah's messenger as saying, I and the last hour have been sent like this, and will, and while doing it, join the fourth finger and the middle finger. The fourth finger and the middle finger are what? Very close. So now he's saying that the, the hour, the last hour, he like the Jehovah Witnesses that made all those false prophecies of when the end time will come. Man, they made so many false prophecies about the end time. I, I don't understand how people still, <laughs> still Jehovah Witnesses. I don't understand how people are, are Muslims either, what kind, kind of do, because you grow up in something just like a Christian. You don't have any idea what's in your book. So now here's another one. He said the last hour will come when the Romans will form a majority amongst people. Now, so you this is this interpreted as the majority amongst people, meaning the Romans going to be the most people on the earth? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. Makes no sense whatsoever. So that's just something, that's just a scratch in the surface. Cause we're gonna, next time we're gonna break down this book. We're gonna break down the Quran. And I'm gonna show you all types of errors, all types of inaccuracies, all types of contradictions. But I first need to break down this one. I'm not so much even worried about, so well, because there's so many things you could have dealt with dealing with Muhammad's life, okay? When this was revealed to Muhammad, this man said it was, he thought it was from Satan. This man, when you read it, it talks, talks about him thinking about committing suicide. Then you got all you got satanic, so-called satanic verses. You talk about time when he go to the people, bring him a message. Then he say, "Man, Satan tricked him. He dealing, he dealing with sexual slavery. He dealing with pedof what we would refer to as pedophilia." Come on, come on. But let me let me since I didn't read many of the scriptures. I want to deal with because that was a question that came up uh, last. I think it was Wednesday. Somebody asked about the uh, about the resurrection and when it takes place, and they were concerned about the resurrection because it, it goes right. It's a segue in from what we were talking about because <laughs> he was talking about when the end was gonna come. We know, according to the word of God, that great tribulation is going to come first. Then, when is the Lord going to return? When is Jesus going to return? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give a light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And what's going to happen, brothers and sisters, is this. And at the time of his coming, there will be a resurrection. This is 1 Thessalonians. The, third, the fourth chapter, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 and 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. So now he's talking about don't be so uh, uh, distraught over those who have died in Christ. He tells you why. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also with sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. How is he going to bring it with him? Are they coming from heaven with him? No, the dead are in the ground. From dust thou art into the dust shalt thou return. They are in the grave, as, as uh, Peter said. Concerning David, his sepulchre is with us even until this day. The one that has risen is Christ. Paul says in another place in uh, what, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus Christ, the first fruits, they that are Christ's win at his coming so he's gonna he's gonna be in the air they're gonna see the sign of the coming of the son of man then they're gonna he's gonna be there and it's gonna be a resurrection he says for this we say unto you by the word of the lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the lord shall not prevent them which are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So now the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who have died in Christ. Then it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Then those who are alive at the time of his return are going to be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But he's not coming to take you off to heaven. He's coming to establish the kingdom here on this earth. Let's go to the book of Zechariah. That's it. So you have to meet him in the air. Because he's coming with his saints. And Zechariah tells you that clearly. This is Zechariah 14. Zechariah the 14th chapter. And we're going to pick it up at verse 9. Oh, excuse me, verse 4. It said, well, verse 3, it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Because he's coming back, you know, it's going to be the battle of Armageddon. And he's going to try to fight God. Then it says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the mount, mount north, and half of it toward the south. Why the Mount of Olives? Because that's where he left from. It was telling you in Acts 1 that he's going to return in like Mount. He left from the mountain called Olive. This is the Mount of Olives. He left from that, and he's returning to that place. Then it says in verse 5, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azar, and ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Because it's going to be a, a great earthquake when he comes back. The earth's going to reel to and fro like a drunkard. Okay? Then it says something. It says something, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. How are they coming with him? Because they meeting him in the air. And then they're going to come and take over this world. See, so that's how he's coming back. That's how he's coming back. So now that's the time of the first resurrection. Let's go to the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, because he's going to establish his kingdom right here on this earth. Okay. You read in verse 19 about Arm chapter 19 of Revelation, you read about Armageddon. Then when he's victorious, what's gonna happen? Revelation 20 and verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. What does he mean, thrones? Who's sitting on thrones? Those who come up in the first resurrection. That's who. It's not a coincidence that in Matthew the 19th chapter. Then when Peter asked him, what shall we have for following you? We've forsaken all and followed you. In 19 and 28 of the gospel, according to Matthew, he says, and Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So now they ain't going to sit on 12 thrones, but also those who come up in the first resurrection are going to inherit that kingdom, and they're going to sit on the throne with him. That's why he tells you this in, in Revelation, the uh, third chapter and verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. His throne is going to be on the earth, headquartered in Jerusalem, on, his, on the throne of David. He said, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. Just like he sat on the father's throne, he overcame. You, you, if you stay the course, you can sit on his throne. So it says in Revelation 20, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. These, so here's the timeline, brothers and sisters. Those that come up in the first resurrection, when he comes back, he's come back immediately after the great tribulation. That's what we read in Matthew 24. Start at verse 29, go to verse about 31. You read about him returning. You read about the sign, the sun and the moon and the stars, the sun and the moon being dark and the stars fall from heaven, powers of the heavens shaking. You see that sign. And there's going to be a first resurrection. They are going to, those are the first resurrection. He's going to be here on this earth. And those are the first resurrection. These resurrected beings are going to reign with him 
1,000 years, okay? He's going to put down, uh, well, you read it in a, in a little later, actually before this in Revelation 19, about him putting down a beast and a false prophet who came to prominence and power during the Great Tribulation, okay? They bribe people to take a mark. See, these are the things that are coming that are coming in the near future. Muhammad said, hey, the, near, the, the last hour is upon us. Talking about 100 years, and it's, it's all going to be over. Okay. But the rest of the dead live. So it says, I saw the souls of them that will be headed for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, now they have received this mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. He said, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So at the, you can have resurrection that is coming, a thousand year or millennial reign of Christ. Okay? And they so those who are resurrected reign with him 1,000 years. Then it says something else. I'm going to skip down. The verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So now you got the second resurrection and the great white throne judgment after a thousand year millennial reign of Christ. Okay. And then after that, brothers and sisters, there is, you got New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. This, this kingdom is going to be presented, be presented to the Father, and you're going to have no more flesh and blood at all. So what's the timeline? See, Muhammad didn't know what he was talking about. What's the timeline? Messiah's coming back immediately after the tribulation. There's going to be the first resurrection at that time. Those who are in the first resurrection are going to gain eternal life and live and reign with Christ a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, you're going to have a great white throne judgment in, the, in those in the second resurrection. And then after that, no more flesh and blood. OK, so with that, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that we at the household of faith meet every Sabbath at 5925 West 25th Avenue, Gary, Indiana. We invite you to come out, worship with us where you can the uncut, unadulterated word of God. You can also. You can also uh, check us out right here on the Israel Teach YouTube channel, as well as, as, as at www.israelteach.org. Um, we live stream there. We live stream in both places. What else? Um, you can give donations at israelteach.org. If you've been edified through our ministry, all the money goes to the, to the ministry. We're not getting paid. Uh, what else? Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna be dealing in the next uh, few times I come before you, Logan. I'm gonna be dealing with just tearing down. Like I said, I'm trying to shut your mouth. I don't, and I'm not reading messages. I don't know what anybody's saying. So, um, if you're listening, uh, peace to you. It's my prayer that you were edified. Um, but yeah, cause people, you know, people talk. And really what it is, people have no idea of what they believe in, but they believe it wholeheartedly. They believe it wholeheartedly and will go to bat and will engage in, in insults and uh, ad hominems and, <laughs> and, Ill, and logical fallacies, anything to prove a point that they have never actually believed. Like I said, brothers and sisters, when we go over this, and these things in the Quran, you should look at people that say they believe in the Quran. Like, what's wrong with you? Because it's you know, and it's always this. It's funny, you know. You see a lot of, especially amongst our people, it's that whole uh, 
persona, right? You know, as if they're somehow more intelligent than you. They have something that you just don't understand. No, what you have is some straight garbage. So like I said, I'm going I'm to I'm break it down. I'm going to shut your mouth. Because one thing you can't come on here, though, I don't know what, I don't know what anybody else is saying, because we ain't even got into, into breaking down the Quran. Like I said, I need to break down some things with the origins, dealing with who you call the prophet, the one that these verses so-called Gabriel brought to. Right? And then we're going we're gonna to break down, again, this Quran, because most of the Quran, according to Islam, the Islamic scholars, has been lost. But that's like I said, we're gonna get we're gonna break it down to where you have because you should know what you believe. That's why I deal with the scriptures, but you should also know what some other people believe, so you know that you believe it correctly. And so when you had the audacity to come on this page. Or anybody that's dealing in the truth page and talk crazy about Islam, well, like I said, I'm gonna have you questioning your whole life. And that's good. You're gonna be angry. You know, you're gonna be angry, but you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna see that what you're talking about is a bunch of nothing. And with that. Pray you enjoy the rest of your Sabbath.